Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. And we have a very, very special episode today. So if you've been looking online in some of the Fragrance Facebook groups, you may have noticed a little bit of excitement building about a very, very exciting new book that's being released. And uh, it is by our guest today. The guest is Gabe Oppenheim. And the name of the book is The Ghost Perfumer. Subtext there. Creed Lies and the Scent of the Century by Gabe Oppenheim. The author is with us today. Hello. Uh, hello, uh, Mr. Smelly slash Dan Norton. Thank you so very much for having me. Uh, that's an absolute pre- pleasure. And thank you so much for giving me what I hope will be the scoop on this book. I haven't got my copy yet, but you very kindly sent me one, which I'm excited to to read. I really, I really am excited to read this. And I know a lot of people are in the fragrance community. So the ghost perfumer is the title of the book. And the image on the front of the book is, I think it's fair to say, uh, based on the most prestigious or the most popular. Ah, there we go. For, for viewers, this is a little bit too close. Mm-hmm. For viewers, this is the, the cover of the book. Um, yeah. it, it was designed uh, actually by, okay, which direction? How can I get this? There we go. Yeah, go. it was it was designed by a very talented young lady who lives in Arizona <laughs> named Francesca, and also uh, had some sketches initially from uh, my girlfriend, who's also a very talented artist in her own way. Um, however, uh, I would say that if you were to look at this cover and decide that it resembles uh, a perfume, uh, that would probably be your own your own judgment. It it <clears> may <throat> not resemble that to everybody. So um, I think it's okay. A that's cover. A- Good clarification there. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Okay, so looking uh, absolutely great. And the, the the premise of the book then, Gabe, I'm, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, I'll get into you and, and who you are and stuff in a minute, but I think many people will be here to find out what the heck this is about. So yeah. what is the premise or the, uh, the synopsis, in a few words, of this remarkable book? Uh, well, remarkable is very kind of you. The book really began mm-hmm. as a project without a particular aim except – to really just sort of dive into this world of perfumery and more specifically to find out who perfumers were. Uh, As a writer, I always find it interesting to find out who people are outside of their books. You know, what's an author like in real life? Um, I did not always grow up enamored of perfume to such a degree that I knew there were perfumers who professionally made these scents. Um, I'm not sure who I thought made them. But I certainly didn't know about firms like Firminish and Givaudan, these multinational Swiss Mm. firms that literally have a stable, have stables of a highly paid and deservedly so very talented uh, perfumers. So sometime when that idea sort of started to come to me that these are humans with real lives uh, who, you know, who inside the lab create these juices that people go crazy for, or maybe people actually hate either way, um, that these are people with lives beyond that lab. I wanted to write about those people very badly. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I mostly write nonfiction. I wrote a lot about boxing. And the thing about fighting um, that when I was covering that was um, it's a blood sport and there's something uh, very terrible and tragic, but also very compelling about um, grievous injury. But that's not really why I wrote about it in the least. I wrote about it uh, because I had an immense interest in who these people were who would decide to devote their lives um, and the very best years of their lives and with possible terrible ramifications uh, to such a sport. Uh, and so it was actually not so different from perfumery. Yeah, I've gotten into <laughs> actual perfumes in many different ways, but the interest was who the hell are these people? They must be smart and also artistic. They must be engineers maybe, but also rather imaginative. These were just sort of assumptions and I wanted to find out the truth. And it was in interviewing uh, perfumers from all sorts of companies, the bigger ones, uh, the smaller ones, independent perfumers. um, And I did a lot of this during the pandemic. So it, it began as a project before the pandemic, but then when we all went into our lockdowns, and the one in New York, which is where I live, uh, began rather early as we were, unfortunately, the first epicenter. Um, mm. A lot of these uh, interviews with perfumers around the world in, in Dubai and Paris and New York, uh, Singapore, things. Like, I don't know if I spoke to someone in Singapore. That may or may not be true. I have to go back and look. But um, I think I wound up interviewing 50, like five zero 
very uh, well-respected top flight uh, perfumers uh, from the comfort of my childhood bedroom uh, during lockdown. It is not a conventional way to go about writing a book or researching one. Uh, there's so much to be gained from being with the person uh, inside the same room, uh, from seeing them up close. But the benefit was I got to pack in interviews with people that were not in the same city, that, that were in far-flung locales. And as I did that, it suddenly became clear to me that there were maybe five stories that stood out uh, sort of above others in terms of their level of intrigue, the quality of the sense themselves, because uh, I've become addicted essentially to smelling these, these things I'm writing about, um, the, the characters involved. Uh, and so I had about five really interesting stories in my mind that I wanted to tell, sort of to pull, to pull away from this larger background and maybe make these mm -hmm. the foreground. Uh, and then some really smart people whose opinions I respect greatly uh, and and whom I was literally consulting outdoors, because again, pandemic. So we'd be like six feet apart on a lawn. They'd be telling me which of these stories they found more interesting. And I'd be like taking notes with this bizarre sort of distance. I've never engaged in an editorial process like that. And to be honest, obviously, I don't think any of us wants us to have anything like that um, again. So yeah, I hope this Omicron thing just goes away. Not that it will just go away, but it... Uh, it was not what I, what I chose. In mm -hmm. any event, though, the, those meetings on these lawns yielded uh, a singular truth. Of the five stories that stood out to my friends, mentors, colleagues, there was one particular uh, research subject that stood out above them all, and it was the brand creed, uh, these quality scents that retailed for lots of money, and the mysteries surrounding the creation of those scents, uh, the success of that company, and the mysteries surrounding the lore and legend the company presented about having been this father to son, yes. patro, you know, patrilineal uh, operation going as yes. far back as 1760. Um, of course, if you're a, a long time operation, you should probably have old perfume bottles, actual physical evidence from mm. those years. And the absence of that uh, was intriguing as well. And so I, I really can't say it was my decision. In fact, I was rather disappointed to have to cut out some certain stories in order to make room more fully for the, the tale of uh, Olivier Creed, the family Creed, and the real creation of the ascents that have netted them a billion dollars in a, the company's sale last year. So I was okay. disappointed that they would have to focus on that. But when people you really respect tell you that's the most interesting story going, that's that's what you follow. But the well, 50 perfumers or so that I interviewed, um, mm. I, I actually feel terrible in that they told some truly remarkable stories as well. And I, I think it's not out of the question at all uh, for me maybe to return and tell those stories in a different volume. Um, exactly. I, yeah. Well, you, you know what? You've got another book there from that. So that's fine. But I think your friends, I tell you what, I think your friends are right. Because the reason I picked up my a device and messaged you was because I, I don't know if I would have done it so quickly if it wasn't this book being about Creed. So just to clarify, because when you started, there, I thought, oh, maybe the book's about loads of other stuff too. But it the main it, this it book is been. mainly about it, it the really story. It really could have been. Sorry, yeah. I couldn't have talked. About this is about this is the book is about Creed, right? Essentially. Well, there are many chapters about the conditions that led uh, to this mm. arrangement that I to discuss. So, for instance. Mm -hmm the very famous perfumer, uh, Pierre Bourdon, uh, mm. who was trained by Edmund Runitska and went to the, the Grasse School of Perfumery run by Rohr. Uh, his mm. father was a co-founder of Parfums Dior, which is the Christian Dior perfume operation, which of course mm. has yielded hits for the last, you know, 80 years, 90 years now. Um, his father, uh, that is to say Pierre Bourdon's father, was not a perfumer himself, just a manager of, of Dior's perfumery, and yet the father's insistence that the son was never a great perfumer, that the son's creations were always uh, insufficient. And I'm not just talking about when Pierre was a child. I'm talking about into Pierre's 40s, when his father was in his 70s, and his father mm. had taken up with another woman and was living out in the countryside, like no longer even a relevant figure in the perfume industry. And yet he was still receiving Pierre letters from his father in which his scents were just ripped apart, really. I mean, just truly 
denigrated and diminished. Uh, and the language mm -hmm. is, is, is very stark and harsh. I know this because I have a copy of one of the letters from 1984. I think the one I have, um, Pierre very kindly showed it to me when we were discussing his father. And so mm -hmm. when you say, but this book is really about creed, well, I would tell you this, if, if there is someone out there who isn't a perfumer, but mm. wants to get away with being one or wants to hire a perfumer, but not give that perfumer, let's say, a typical credit uh, or maybe even just compensation, mm. that, that kind of non-perfumer faker would do well to find a perfumer who is very, very smart, but also has something of a self-confidence issue who maybe has a father who never approved of his sense, who maybe feels always that he is slightly unworthy. If you were to really be a sort of savvy businessman, and I've always thought that the people in this book who are businessmen are rather savvy indeed, and the businesswomen too. Um, if you're not a perfumer and you wanna hire one, a really good one, find one whose sense of self is perhaps already slightly diminished. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very interesting. So many people have said for many years that the perfumer Pierre Bourdon, who has created many great designer scents, including Coros by Yves Saint Laurent, not to mention many others. Uh, I've Yo, heard for Yo, many, many years. Yo Bohm, Davidoff Cooled Water. I mean, there's, yeah. he's got a, an unbelievable CV. If you okay. don't count any of the secret stuff, just the stuff that's known, it's a, a tremendous CV. Then add to the resume the secret stuff. I, I would say... It's not really fun and nice to rank artists, but if we're going to mm. play that game, it would be hard to not rank him in the top five and and maybe a hundred, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So my question here is: uh, 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 many people have said he was the perfumer behind Green Irish Tweed, uh, and some have suggested he, he may have the been the perfumer. He is the perfumer behind Green Irish Tweed. The is one... he the ghost perfumer then? Well, the one thing I can tell you before I got into my book research that was already out in the world. Uh, Michael yeah. Edwards, who uh, lives in Australia and compiles a tremendously helpful database of which uh, scents were created by whom, um, he, uh, along with Luca Turin, established, before I ever began writing my book or even researching it, uh, that Pierre Bourdon was indeed the author of Green Irish Tweed. Um, mm -hmm. Now, because that scent came out in 1985, uh, Luca, who's been a wonderful help to me, of course, he's a, a like neuroscientist, physicist, genius, who's also a perfume critic. Um, you know, he doesn't even remember fully how the two of them kind of unraveled the Green Irish Tweed mystery. Uh, but basically they did prior to my getting involved. What they yeah. didn't unravel at all was how that had come to pass. It's really easy to say, um, and by the way, it, it's not so easy to say. It's a huge step yeah. to say that Pierre Bardon contrary to all the things Creed says about its sense being made uh, for hundreds of years, about Green Irish Tween being made for Cary Grant, contrary yes. to all of that, it does take a lot of research and a lot of guts to say, well, that's not at all the case. This was just Pierre Baudon's perfume uh, from the 1980s. It has nothing to do with Cary Grant. Cary Grant never wore this in his life. It, that does take a, a lot of research. So that was their yes. step, and I can't take credit for it. The, sure. the next step with Green Irish Tweed, however, though, and I so apologize if you were about to, to cut in, I sincerely apologize. I think my connection is slightly lagging. Um, but the next question would be, OK, if this guy's so talented and Pierre truly is, how the hell did Creed even convince him to do Green Irish Tweed? And how did he convince him to not take credit for it? And how did he manage yes. to take the credit for it himself and do so in yes. such an outlandishly public way that you would assume he'd be caught? Because it's, it's, it's sort of odd to have a lie be that very public. Uh, mm. So I was not the one who established initially authorship of Green Irish Tweed as, as Pierre's. Mm -hmm. But I certainly was maybe the first, not maybe, I am the first to have tried to figure out how the hell that could have happened, why it happened, mm. how yes. Olivier himself even discovered the juice. Um, for instance, Green Irish Tweed's fantastic, right? And it was, yes. it's, it's because Pierre spends years and years working on accords, like all good perfumers do. Well, yes. how would Olivier even know about the evolution of Pierre's fresh accords? What, was mm -hmm. he in his office? Did he have access to them? How does that even work? So yes. 
my book in, is in uh, is sort of an extension. And you've unraveled. Right? You've unraveled some of this in the book. No, I've unraveled all of it. Okay. Can I just back because I just want a lot of people will be here because I'm going to say or that the, the thumbnail of the video might sort of make the, the the suggestion that this is about the Creed story and maybe leading up to who made Aventus and all the other ones. Uh, so can I just read out the thing on your website, which uh, summarizes the book and just come back to, and ask you a, a pertinent question. So uh, on so, the so, front well, sort of... By all means, the, please. Yeah, the, the front thing then on your website where... Oh, by the way, guys, you can buy the book by going to the ghost, ghostperfumer.com, which I will link in the description. I think it's up at something like $27. I didn't set right? the prices. My my publisher did, but I think that's about right, yes. It's and in I, that I kind of apologize. Ballpark. I know it's a lot. You Believe me, shipping and logistic choice, like uh, prices, that stuff's all gone up because of the pandemic. Uh, I'm not uh, an economist, but I've been told it's legit. And as an author, I can assure you I will not get rich. I'm happy being poor uh, as I am. Writing is my passion. Uh, so you, I apologize that it's a $27 book. I think it's worth it, but I do apologize for is. the price. I would pay that. I I shouldn't tell you that because you sent me a free copy very kindly. But I would I would have paid that if you hadn't. So it's it's fine with me. Uh, and you can buy it on Amazon too. It, the the Amazon thing will be linked down there too. They can only ship at the moment Amazon to the USA, Canada, and Mexico. But if you are elsewhere in the world, go to theghostperfumer.com, and I believe you can ship pretty much all around the world, which is great news. So I will link all that. Now I just want to read what you've said. So this is the sort of headline thing on on your website, okay? Sure. The, yeah. There there is no real Creed family fragrance history. The venture began in earnest when Creed began insinuating his way into the offices of perfumers blank and blank and sniffing all the trials on their desk. This is a book that reveals that it was not the Creed family who were the perfumers behind Aventus, Green Irish Tweed, Silver Mounted, or Millicene Imperial. The ghost perfumer is revealed within these pages. So do we have, I mean, are, you, you seem to be insinuating that the perfumer in question, and you can edit this out if I'm not allowed to reveal, that is Pierre Bourdon in every case. Is that right? Uh, well, it's 100% not true that in every case, uh, Pierre Bourdon was the ghost perfumer. Uh, for instance, Pierre Bourdon retired more or less. I mean, he still does some stuff on the side. But as a full-time perfumer, Pierre retired in 2007. Now, I can okay. tell you who created Aventus. But before I do that, I, I would just tell you Aventus was created in 2010. And this isn't some, you know, time travel movie, right? So um, Pierre was already retired by the time that came okay. out. Royal so we need to Royal buy the Lude. book. We need to buy the book to find out the actual details and who did what and when. Okay, fantastic. But I wanna, I wanna I not, it. I wanna not give any misconceptions about anything no. here. And and the first misconception that people are going to have is this book is about Pierre Bourdon being the king of Creed or something to that effect. No. Mm -hmm. And I I first want to say I think before Pierre uh, was ever actually approached by Olivier Creed. Um, and the way that happened, you might consider a little bit unfair, a little bit sneaky, maybe going into someone's office when you're not necessarily invited or welcome. That's mm -hmm. maybe not a business tactic I would take up. But um, I, I, based on my research, uh, before Pierre was ever asked to do a scent for Creed, and asked is a sort of nice way of, of describing the process, um, yeah. uh, Olivier Creed went to Bernard Elena. So perhaps your viewers are familiar with Jean-Claude Elena, the perfumer who worked at Hermes for so long and did Terre d'Hermes and was at mm -hmm. Givaudan prior to that and uh, had a long, illustrious career and lives in the south of France. He used to play the transverse flute, uh, a very interesting sort of philosophical type. Uh, anyway, his brother, mm -hmm. Bernard Elena, also was a perfumer. Bernard Elena was approached by Olivier Creed and Olivier Creed went into his office, began sniffing the various mods and trials of perfumes he was working on. And in this invasive sort of way, uh, Olivier landed on a scent made by Bernard Elena that he wanted to call his own and put out into the world as an item to be bought, um, as though it, it, it had been formulated by him, um, created by him, crafted by him, ho however you want to say it. Mm -hmm. And so that happened. And so uh, Bernard Elena was the very first person uh, whom Olivier Creed, uh, per my research, um, sort of insinuated his way well i should say the very first good perfumer um mm -hmm. there, there are probably some scents uh earlier even than this bernard elena scent um mm -hmm. but but creed's very smart olivier creed is a tremendously talented fragrance evaluator i would argue i think many people including uh, julian raskinet 
who is a, a tremendous perfumer at IFF currently, they would tell you that he may be Olivier Creed is the best fragrance evaluator in the world and has been for 50 okay. years. And okay. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. So I think he learned very early on, Olivier did, that if he was going to obtain scents and call them his own, he wanted to yes. obtain the absolute best ones. And so okay. there probably are some scents um, that don't merit mention, whose creators weren't that great. But uh, he quickly sort of learned, uh, Olivier Creed, that perhaps it would be better to approach someone with real, real talent. So uh, he went to Bernard Elena and sniffed a bunch of samples and mods. And one of those eventually became a Creed scent with a fake backstory and with a supposed <laughs> authorship uh, by Olivier Creed. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, uh, Olivier Creed approached uh, Pierre Bourdon's first wife, Francoise, and tried to sniff her samples and mods and use mm. uh, one of her fragrances as a creed and, and to okay. create a whole fake backstory for that. Um, but she kicked him out of the office. I give her all the credit in the world. She would not let him do it. Uh, and then, of course, once the wife kicked the guy out, he went straight to the husband, Olivier Creed. And so you, you could say that maybe uh, Pierre Bourdon uh, enters the story because just before he does, uh, his, his first wife says, not a chance in hell you're doing this to me, Mr. Mr. Creed. So is there a lot of ghost perfumery involved? Is there a lot of Pierre Bourdon involved? Absolutely. But is it exclusively okay. Pierre Bourdon? No. Um, okay. But I will say one very famous perfumer told me, and I, you know, I'll take this quote uh, as maybe not the theme, but a certainly like sort of a leitmotif of, of this book. He said, look, Yes, it's true that Pierre didn't do every scent. And if you want to know who did do every scent, you can read the book. But it's 100% true that had there not been Pierre Bardon, there would be no creed. Because the work mm -hmm. that he did, um, the foundations that he set up for later work by others, the various movements uh, involving the development of accords, um, all of that built up not just individual sense, but a mm -hmm. basis on which other scents could be built. So sure. uh, when that famous perfumer said, Pierre Bourdon made Creed because without him, there would be no such thing. Um, I think he summed up the story rather well, but that doesn't mean that there okay. wasn't also sense by Elena, right? You know, and by others. Yeah, yeah, well. okay. I, yes, okay. Let me come in here because let's do, most viewers have a familiarity probably with the House of Creed, but let's see why this is all so fascinating and perhaps so controversial, okay? Let's see what the backstory is. And obviously you'll have to read the book to get, you'll give a more depth, in-depth thing about the backstory of Creed. But most of us who know the House of Creed know that they come in these nice boxes and very much all over the thing, it says 1760 um, from from father to son since 1760, implying that the fragrance house has been making perfume since then. One of the things when I got into niche perfume and it was my favorite house that I discovered, I bought into this this great idea of this ancient house or very old house, and you know that it was it was you know separate to and almost above Chanel or Dior because it was made for royalty and all the you know all this kind of stuff. And you get these lovely little cards here with a picture I think of the original James Creed from London. And the main man there, the, the patriarch figure, Olivier Creed, is is on there too now. And the perfumes today, of course, are credited. If you go on Fragrantica, the perfumer is Olivier Creed, or so, I think sometimes perhaps Olivier and his son, Erwin Creed. Um, so this is the the, the, the backstory and, and the thing that gives it this, this house this wonderful exclusivity um, and this great feeling. And now, of course, we all know it's, it's one of the most famous fragrance brands in the world. It has now come into sort of ordinary people's consciousness somebody i know that i went to school with wanted me to donate a free perfume or something to their school reunion and she said maybe you can give us a free bottle of creed aramis okay wrong but you, you know it's, it's there she's not a perfume person it's very famous okay so that people have really bought into this idea so my question to you is mm. Well, one, there's a couple of questions. First of all, why not just say we're really good and we use these, we used Pierre Bourdon. Uh, but I guess the answer is almost in what I've said is it's that people want this idea that it's this ancient historic or very old historic house. So I you guess know, that might thing. be. The, you, I, also, I, just one other small thing. Sure. Yeah. If you can give us a bit more on this stuff that's expanded on in the book, 
about you've really researched like what was Creed in 1938 because that was fantastic. You found articles from magazines where it's listed as a rather nice clothes shop and tailor mm. with almost or no mention whatsoever of perfumes which they were supposedly creating then. So if you can give us a bit on like what actually was going on with Creed before Pierre Bourdon and the 19, I think you say about 1983 is when the modern fragrance company began to emerge. So yeah. what, what was happening before then? Mm. Maybe that's my question to you. I mean, obviously people need to read the book, but if you can give us a little bit of a no, hint, there, that would be wonderful. There's, there's lots I can, I'm happy to say. And yes. I mean, look, the truth is I would rather tell everyone the full story right here and right now. Um, but because I signed a contract with a publisher, um, yeah, no, it's not entirely my choice. So I don't. I don't. We want think to they tease want them a bit. We want to tease them a bit. I'll tease no, what I, I would, can I, out of you, but yeah, I've, 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 I've had many um, uh, partners, uh, you know, not spouses, but you know, uh, girlfriends who have said um, teasing is good, and I would generally say, yeah, but also the full story is good. Uh, but no, I can oh. do a tease. We can do that. Was that too naughty for you? Was that too naughty? No, for you? I love naughts. <laughs> trust me that's nothing no that's perfect i'm with you all the way on that yeah i mean it's, it's fascinating to get a i mean there's enough on your website that i guess is in the public domain that if you can just allude to some of the things that that you have oh, no, put no, out there yeah, already love... that would sure, be yeah, great no, the, so... the details you've got to buy the book yeah no i, I so basically it's 100 percent true that uh, if you were to go back hundreds of years creed first in england and then um coming over to france was uh, men's uh, haberdashery shop. They made, made high-end clothing uh, for men. And the thing that is very pivotal that people don't often talk about is this sort of brotherly, uh, and I, of course, I do mention this in the book, but I'm happy to discuss it, this brotherly sort of feud that emerged in the early 20th century um, that sort of happened right at the end of World War II although maybe it started a little before the war started. So, but like the post-war period, mm -hmm. you had these two brothers, two creeds. Uh, one of them was Olivier's father. Olivier's father was uh, stodgy, traditional. He wanted to keep making tweed clothing for men in the Paris shop in which they had been making tweed clothing for men for many years. Now, if that sounds like an unexciting idea of life to you, you're not alone because his brother said, no, I love going around palling around with models. I'm going to go to London and leave this, you know, Paris city that you guys hang out in. I'm going to establish mm -hmm. myself as a woman's couturier. You know, yeah, my, my French, terrible. But I'm going to do women's couture. I'm going to be a couturier. Uh, I'm going to sleep with the models, which in a Me Too era would get him canceled faster uh, then Usain Bolt can run. I, I don't know. Very quickly. But he <laughs> really had a plan. And the plan was, I don't want to do men's clothing anymore. That's that's uh, like unbelievably dull. You know, the Tweety suits. No, I'm not going to do Tweety suits for men. Maybe for women, because mm -hmm. that's an interesting look. Not for men. I'm going to leave the city. I'm going to go to London, establish my own operation. And he did. His name was Charles Creed. He's Olivier Creed's uncle. Um, he yep. became a hugely successful uh, women's wear designer. You can find yeah. mentions of him in the New York Times and Vogue and French, uh, sorry, French, excuse me, fashion publications. Yeah. Were, were Is that the guy that's pictured in somewhere on your site, I think? Yeah, yeah, he is. He, there, he's can I put twice. that picture in the video? Yeah, yeah. He's, that he, one. he loves posing with women as though he's about to sleep with them because the unfortunate... I'm going to put that on the screen now, yeah, because yeah, I'm allowed he, to put that up, yeah. Yeah, Keep he, going. He, he did actually, in fact, like he select models for the sort of purpose of them modeling clothing and then him taking them out on round, rowdy sort of nights on the town. I mean, he was Sounds a randy good. person. There's there's no nothing wrong with that. Away. Yeah. And, and he wound up marrying, by the way, an editor of Vogue. Right. So he was firmly in the fashion firmament. This dude, he died super okay. young because he partied hard. But he, he he discovered on his honeymoon that he had gout. That was on his honeymoon. Like the dude lived fast and hard. And that's an exciting life. Really, yes. truly. Like now it. imagine the other guy, the brother who mm. is back in Paris, still making the same men's tweed suits for the same business gentleman um, for a good amount of money. I mean, they weren't uh, wanting for money, the creeds in Paris. Doesn't sound but, like a bad life. Yeah. But were they wanting for excitement? And so now you uh. have Olivier and he has two examples before him. He has an uncle who, yeah, was involved in fashion, but like the cool element of fashion, the thing that was starting in the 1960s, beginning to be very hip. I mean, Fashion changed so much 
And it changed so much just when Olivier Creed was becoming a man who had to figure out his future. Um, in fact, his uncle Charles, the one who would sleep with the models, the one who worked in London, designed dresses for uh, the Russian premier Nikita Khrushchev's wife, I believe. I think there's a photo of that you can find online. I don't know that I own the wow. rights to that one. Um, so that's an exciting life, like Cold War modeling. There's a lot going on there. Um, Love it. Old fashioned tailoring that hasn't changed the cut of the suit for however many decades during a period when hippies are emerging. Um, yeah. You're getting all these student revolts in, pa in Paris and France yes. at that time. 1968, yes. Yeah. Correct. These things don't go together. If you're a young person sure. going into the, the, the career of stodgy suit maker for the, the people you're yes. supposed to be rebelling against. All right, so what do you do? Well, you can abandon fashion entirely. Yes. Or just maybe, what if you found a field that was adjacent to, to fashion? That was and this is Olivia Creed we're talking about, the, the, the man on your card here when you buy a Creed fragrance. Yeah, just to clarify, carry on, yeah. And so how does Olivier Creed get into these fragrance uh, world when the company beforehand was merely uh, a, a company that did first men's clothing and they was a little bit of a, a, a schism and or schism, if you prefer, either way is correct. Um, how does he go from clothing to perfume? It's because the clothing thing is becoming suffocating and the fashion world, as he sees from his uncle, is exciting as hell. And fragrances are part of that new excitement. Um, that makes sense. And so I can't tell you 100% what was in his head, but I, I can tell you based on research, he 100% told his father he didn't want to do the old fashioned tailoring thing. And he was told, supposedly anyway, by uh, some people back in the 60s when he first got this idea, oh, um, you're going to fail. You'll never make it as a, as a fragrance person. Now, the funny thing about the research I have uh, about those conversations is, if Creed was a 300-year-old perfumery, why are people in the 1960s telling him he's going to fail? At that point, the company should be 250 years old or something. But in any event, he <laughs> gave him credit yeah. for being resilient. People said, mm. oh, fragrance, we're old-fashioned tailors. That's not for us. That will never work. You can't make money off that. That's not whatever. And so he found some perfumers. I don't know their names. I'm not even sure he might remember their names, but they're lost to history. But he found some perfumers to help him put together some really, really mediocre to bad perfumes, probably in the year 62 or 63. Now, again, if Creed were a famous historical perfumery um, going back hundreds of years, he wouldn't have hmm. needed to find someone to help him pull together some bad fragrance, nor would he have done the following. He left Paris in a car, drove to Lille, to a very tiny little shop because he thought, mm. okay, I'm starting a perfume enterprise. Let's see if I can maybe have a success even in this little tiny shop, which was called the Soleil d'Or. Okay. So yeah. he went to the Soleil d'Or. He, he offered them a couple cents made by whoever it was he pulled or, you know, he pulled from the crowd he knew, not famous perfumers, and they did not sell. You know, at one point, uh, Creed tells the press, well, at the Soleil d'Or, I outsold Guerlain and I outsold, I outsold Dior. Well, I have a history of the store that the Soleil d'Or store itself published. And it says, no, the sense didn't sell. And so he wants to do something fun. He wants to do something fashionable. And now he's got this failure. What's the next step? Well, you could give up. Or what actually happened maybe is the most logical thing. Find a really good perfumer and then go and try to see if you can kick the ass of Dior and Guerlain with some real talented folks making the juice. So, so why the transition from clothing to perfume? Because I think he was stifled by the idea of becoming his dad. Uh, yeah. I don't know that he ever wanted to run around with women the way that like his uncle did. I mean, his uncle died young. Like there's, there's yeah. a, Olivier likes to party. He had a wife, he divorced. The wife actually technically is the owner of the Carden Creed shop in Paris on Avenue de Serbier. In any event, uh, Fabienne. Um, I'm not saying Olivier doesn't like to party, but but the uncle really partied. So he honestly, I think it was rather logical. Like fragrance sounds like a cool opportunity. Um, and give him credit when when it failed at first, he came up with a plan to make it not fail again. Now, part of that plan was to pretend he was someone he absolutely wasn't. And you said, why didn't he just admit that he was hiring great perfumers? Yeah. Oof. 
I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's maybe the greatest mystery uh, I encountered in this whole story. And if, I'd be lying if I said I fully understood it. I think there's something psychological and, and deep that I can't reach about that fact. Um, yeah. You know, because at it, that point it, in time, if he was not known for perfume, it would almost be better to say, hey, and the perfumer is this guy. I mean, I don't know. Oh, for uh, sure. For sure, for sure, for sure. A hundred percent. I I I I don't know what was was he for some weird reason possessive, right? So yeah, he's making something. It can't be the work of anyone else. Was he the sort yeah. of person who in this maybe may look, it could simply be also, you know, we talk about Dior and Guerlain. Well, those are surnames. Doesn't mean, of yes. course, we know better that every Christian Dior was made by someone named Christian Dior. Obviously, that's not how it worked at all. And no, even and, and that's even fine. The Garrett, Nobody minds that. No, that's not fine. not at all. Yeah. But maybe in his head, again, he was a younger man at the time, and uh, I'm, this is somewhat of a hypothesis that I don't know anyone will ever be able to fully test out. Maybe he thought, "Oh, wow, people get to put their names on bottles," and there was a possessive element of branding element, a, a sort of ego element where he, his ego yes. wouldn't allow him to acknowledge someone else. But okay. honestly, you're right. It makes no sense because he had a tremendous idea. Get the best perfumers in the world. He, I'm already rich, so let's use the best materials and let's see what, yeah. cr what's created. Why lie yes. about that? I don't know. It's, it's fascinating. Well, but, but, on the other hand, as a person who got into Creed, it kind of does make some sense because I thought, wow, I love this little card that they give you and it's so special and it's different. That's why it's, that's why it's a niche house. It's not Chanel or Dior. It's almost, you know, artisanal. These guys have been doing it for hundreds of years and it says all this stuff about Napoleon the um, yeah. Third, Princess Eugenie, George the Fourth the reign of Victoria and the idea that the, you know, these weren't doing it only on a bespoke level for hundreds of years did make it more special. So, you know, I'm saying maybe why didn't it, why did it matter? But I could, maybe it, that was the unique selling point in a way that made you think, Oh wow. Creed is so special. And it, it worked on me a little bit. I got to be honest with you. Cause I, I, I knew people were skeptical, but I bought into the idea that this was a super exciting historical brand and special, more special than my Chanel's or my Dior's that I'd owned before I found out. So, you know, maybe, it, I mean, he was clever. I think he was clever, wasn't he? Well, I would give him credit 100% for the marketing because we both know it's worked, not just on you, on yeah. the world. I, yeah, I, had yeah. to go to, I had to go to Dubai to research this book at one point. And on yes. my Emirates flight, you can order Aventus in your seat. At, on, like there's a screen, of course, because that's how airplanes mm -hmm. are these days. And from your screen, you can order a bottle of Creed Aventus. Now, maybe mm. that shouldn't shock me, right? But I, yes. I'm doing research on this whole crazy mystery, this whole crazy lie about, you know, who did the creeds and when they were made. And, and meanwhile, it's being offered up on a screen on an airplane. So damn right, his marketing worked. I, I'll give him full props for that. Yep. Why did he turn to that? Was it because he was a marketing genius? Was it because... He also felt possessive of the brand and wanted it to be just him. Was it a combination? I don't know for sure. But I think your hypothesis, at the very least, has got to be partially correct because you're damn right. The marketing worked. I mean, this stuff sold. But also, I will say also, Creed was wealthy and not stingy in that there are a lot of wealthy perfumers who still want to get huge margins on their perfume, and they're obsessed by the margins. Olivier wasn't hmm. like that. So when he brought in these famous perfumers, yeah, he lied about who maybe made the perfumes. But what he didn't do was restrict the price of the oil. So these uh -huh. perfumers were using the very best materials. And so mm -hmm. while I, I, I believe fully that the marketing probably worked a good deal, as you say, I, I would also give Olivier credit for just simply saying, you know what, if I give these dudes the best materials, and, and by dudes, I mean mm -hmm. men, women, anybody, I give them yeah. the best materials. Yeah, my margin might go down, but these could be masterpieces. And so, you know, I think mm -hmm. for me, yeah, obviously I know that the true story has nothing to do with their marketing, but I wear yeah. Creed scents because they smell fantastic and there is actually I mean, a superlative level of ingredient. So I agree um, with I think, you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love their fragrances, and what you're saying makes sense. I mean, let's face it, um, Pierre Bourdon then recreated Green Irish Tweed f in the form of Davidoff Coolwater, but it, it many, well, they, they, there's a similarity, but you can smell 
there is a much higher quality, something more magical in green Irish tweed, which fits in exactly with what you're saying. You know, um, many people are saying, oh, I, don't, I think it's all BS about the ingredients being that good. But I am I have a pretty big collection and I do find something a little bit magical that I love in the smell. And I don't think it's, it's just all the marketing has, has worked on me. So I, I agree that I do think they do use great ingredients. And, you know, whatever the the controversy of the backstory at the end of the day i have loads of them that i really love wearing and i don't mind at all that i spent a bit of money on them so you know i'm still a big fan but i'm very very intrigued by this, this can, I, can i add one thing story. about the ingredients yeah. um if yeah. i may mm. Mm. so i went to normandy to the castle in which pierre bourdon uh, currently resides um yes it was incredibly kind of him to welcome me it was a magical so you day met pierre I, bourdon Oh yeah, oh yeah. I spent time yeah. with Pierre and his, but, and his lovely wife, and and I cannot tell you how kind they were to me, and unexpectedly so, because I didn't necessarily think they'd be so um, inviting to uh, an interloper, someone who used to write about boxing, and you know, yeah. someone someone somewhat new to the fragrance uh, reporting game. Uh, that yeah. being said, before I went to his his Normandy home, I had been in contact with him via the internet for quite a long time, and we had mm -hmm. exchanged many messages and. He had already told me his life story. The, the visit was almost a culmination, uh, a kind of like ceremonial thing more than a full on yeah. reporting session. The reporting was. Can I just put gone. the. There's a couple of pictures that I've seen on your website. So I hope they're okay to put in here. But I'll put, yeah. if it's okay, the, the picture yeah, of him sure, sure, uh, at sure, home yeah. with his, his leopard skin carpet. And there was also a picture of the young him as a rather dandyish looking man in, in a black and white picture. So I think people will, will be very intrigued if I put those on the screen around now. Now, please keep going. Yeah, very interesting. So you met Pierre, Pierre Baudon. Is he upset about this or does he not really mind about what, what's happened with the Creed fragrances? Well, do, do you mind if I finish the ingredient story really quick? Sure, yes. I'm Please, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so I was sitting, we, we had lovely, uh, we had a lunch, uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre's wife, a, a, a perfumer uh, whom I'm close to and, and whose work I respect a lot, a current perfumer, um, who, who has a license to drive in France and came with me on the two hour trek north from Paris to Normandy. Anyway, we were sitting down at lunch and Olivier, not Olivier, excuse me, uh, Pierre was laughing about how, uh, poorly Olivier did balancing of budgets, like. He, he would spend so much money on materials, raw ingredients for these perfumes, uh, that when it was all added up, the, the, normally when you make a perfume for a big company or even a smaller one, you've got to make sure that the cost of the oils adds up to a certain thing, certain bottom line and doesn't exceed that. Otherwise, mm. you've essentially lost the brief. Like they won't give you the, the winning, uh, you won't be the winning uh, author of this scent if you go yep. over the limited num amount of money they have to make it. Well, yep. <laughs> Olivier went over every amount of money that was like ever discussed. The, 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 the joke that uh, Pierre told was basically, this dude just didn't even know how to balance books. But that was a compliment, meaning Pierre yeah. was saying, you can people can call him whatever they want to call him. But because he didn't balance books, you were getting like, just this excess of stuff, really, really beautiful materials. And, and as someone who you know, studied in the south of France, who now lives in Normandy, who's around great materials. Pierre thought that was fantastic. So now to the question of, is he bitter? Uh, that's really complicated. Um, I think Pierre is bitter about some things and not others. Um, for one, you know, he and his wife were, I think, very hesitant. I know they were very hesitant. Uh, they told me to have someone uh, as a writer sort of act as their... Uh, agent of vengeance they don't want any vengeance they don't want mm. uh, sort of retribution and they hon honestly they're not looking for anything they're, they don't want you know remuneration i mean last year blackrock uh, this financial firm the world's largest manager of assets um by a certain measures they bought creed for a billion dollars but yep. I'll, I'll tell you right now pierre bardon and his wife kathy they have a very blissful existence as far as i can tell um, mm. the, they have a, they have a pool and like a little burbling brook. They have friends nearby. It's actually very cozy and rustic. They're not, you know, Jean-Claude Elena is in the South of France. He's in that scene. This is the North of France, which is a more, a less, a less sexy, more cozy vibe maybe. And, and a wonderful yeah. sort of interesting, um, life to live. Uh, the, the home itself has, has museum like objects. Anyway, uh, neither one of them wanted me to seek anything for them or, or, yeah. and all I told them many times was the only thing I want to seek is the truth and the proper byline as a writer who's worked for newspapers and magazines. If my article appeared with someone else's byline, if it said 
you know, by Dan Norton, and I wrote it, um, I would feel compelled to uh, uh, protest that personally. Um, yes. So to some degree, all of that has been let go um, by Pierre and Kathy. Uh, the fact that mm. they were never properly remunerated despite Olivier's promises, the fact that um, in reality, uh, all you can say uh, Pierre got for his work was a couple of very finely tailored Creed suits. Um, it, we were laughing about the suits. We were having fun about, you know, suit jokes uh, at, at his house. The, the only bitterness that I really sense involves not the work for Creed, but the development of, uh, see, Pierre's an ideas person. He went to a really good university. He went to Sciences Po and, and, and he, he studied Proust. He's intellectually head and shoulders above any perfumer I personally have ever spoken to or met, which at this point is a decent number, at least in this yeah. era. And what he was doing in the 1980s with Green Irish Tweed and with Cool Water, which you know about, and with several other scents and sort of mods yep. that I talk about in my book, he was working on a new idea of freshness. He was working on twists mm. to, to gray flannel from Jeffrey Bean to Dracar yep. Noir. He was working on an idea, solely an idea for about a decade of how to make a freshness that just didn't exist in perfumery yet. Subsequent to that, with Yop Om, which he did, he was doing the same thing, but again, in a sort of different context. How can I make a fragrance with a certain kind of sweetness that just hasn't been done? And the only bitterness I think he truly feels is A, Cool Water was rejected eight times. Chantal Rose of Yves Saint Laurent. I love Chantal. She's a big uh, PSG fan. So when we had lunch recently off the Champs Elysees, we talked about soccer, which was very lovely. Um, and it, she doesn't deny or admit this, but uh, Pierre Bourdon's memory is that when he submitted um, what became Cool Water for the fragrance uh, that was jazz eventually, um, Chantal Rose, instead of making this Cool Water the fragrance, said it smells of green beans. Because Cool Water was rejected essentially eight times, um, sometimes it's hard to remember who said what uh, in rejecting it. Hermes was looking for a scent they were eventually going to call it Bel Ami. And when Pierre, you know, released this unbelievable fresh new thing to win the Bel Ami brief for Hermes, the then manager of Hermes, uh, according to Pierre's recollection, said, your, perf your perfume has all the qualities of a huge hit, which is why we cannot adopt it. It'll just become more popular than the leather products for which we're known. The entire image of Hermes will, will essentially change. Um, I, I can't say that that's exactly what was said. It's Pierre's recollection. Um, and the person who said it would certainly not admit it. Um, but the funny part about it is uh, after the fact, Pierre tells me in the present, I was so devastated because I knew it was such a specious argument. So so yeah, the YSL rejection mm. was this Cool Waters thing smells like green beans. The Hermes rejection was this will take away from the leathery nature of our business. And in the end, uh, eight times over, Cool Water was rejected. And so imagine if instead of that happening, Cool Water is, is never rejected because this guy has already been this creed genius and an acknowledged one. Imagine then what he can do once he has to move on and he's allowed to move on uh, from these really sort of piddling, silly rejections. I think what happened is if Pierre had gotten credit for these creed perfumes, he perhaps mm. would have not been rejected so many times by, mm. to be honest, maybe subpar evaluators. Because yep. the truth is, Cool Water should have come out when before Green Irish Tweed. Cool Water started out as an accord submitted for a fragrance called Lancome Sagamore from like 1984, about a year before Green Irish Tweed ever exists. Now, mm -hmm. if Lancome, right, Lancome, if you say it correctly, if Lancome accepts green, what's essentially Cool Water slash Green Irish Tweed, right, depending on how you want to call it, if they accept it then in 84, Pierre can now move on to other ideas. And he had so many, still does. He still formulates in his studio, in his, in his office, I should say, every day. Mm -hmm. Will you ever see those perfumes? You may, depending if you read the ending of my book, you may. But okay. he's not obviously within the, the sort of hot kind of constantly moving cycle of fragrance development in Paris. He's still in his mm -hmm. own place, but, but he still creates. So now imagine yeah. if, imagine if, Creed was honest. I don't mean yeah. just Olivier, I mean the company. Who the fuck is going to turn down Pierre Bourdon when he's created all of these scents for Creed? You think that Cool mm. Water is going to be rejected eight times? Hermes is going to mm. reject it. 
Lancome is going to reject it. Um, I mean, it, it allows Pierre to do so much more that he was sort of stifled from doing. He is yeah. bitter about the rejections, like when someone would say, oh, this smells like green beans. You know, yeah. I'm maybe bitter that because of the secrecy that Creed maintained and the lies that Creed propounded, uh, Pierre never got the chance time-wise um, maybe to do some extraordinary things that I don't know what they would smell like, but I, that's the brilliant part of it, right? There's no way my imagination could. So, so mm. we'll never know what we lost because of that. But yes. that's my bitterness more than his in a way. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, obviously he had the other things which are publicly recognized, e.g. chorus, and it sounds like he did okay. But yeah, you can see your point. It could have been even no, no, better. Financially, by the way, he'll, he'll tell you, like, please don't yeah. make it seem as though I'm financially hurting. Like, he's perfectly yeah. happy. He was compensated well. He, he's led a good life and he's not upset. Yes. He's, he's truly content so far as I can tell. Um, okay. But but ask him about being rejected eight times with cool water and you start yeah. to see that, you know, history could be very different just very very different. yes fascinating okay yeah just you, you made an important point that i just want to tell people of course so the company uh famously has stuff on there about father to son but it was uh sold last i think last year to the the big big conglomerate and is now no longer owned by by anyone from the creed family are they still involved because i believe olivia and erwin are still somehow involved in the company they just don't own it is that right yeah, uh, the, contractually, they still have, I think, some ties and obligations. I've not seen the contracts, but sure. Um, so they're I, I not think completely the people, disconnected, but no, they are no longer. Um, you know, one of my sources told me that um, Olivier's fear was that because Irwin was interested in race car driving and not perfumery in the least, that yeah. the, the 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 House of Creed, which was to be fair a lie anyway, um, would 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 yeah. die with Olivier. Okay. Um, but to be honest, I think the real reason for the sale, right, is Aventus so exploded from its launch in 2010 to the yeah. company sale in 2020 that by the time yeah. the company was discussing uh, a sale of itself, its annual revenues yeah. were somewhere near $270 million. And yeah. this is a tiny company and the world's largest asset manager offered them about a billion dollars. So, yeah. I, you know, Who if would Irwin say no. had been interested in perfumery instead of race car driving, they probably would have taken the deal to some degree anyway. I don't know the degree yeah. of their involvement. I, I think they're probably yeah. just figureheads. The CEOs and the, the chief marketing officer, the people that BlackRock installed to run Creed now are just excellent at what they do. They come from other perfume companies um, and, and luxury brands. I've, I've spoken to several yeah. of them. I actually have a great deal of affection for what they're trying to do uh, now. I mean, they've been in, in power now for you know, less than a year, uh, but they're doing some cool yeah. things. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just to summarize that, obviously the perfumes they've released recently, e.g. Viking Cologne, I believe that the, this, the perfumery is still credited to Olivia and or Irwin. That hasn't changed, right? So the, that that's still there. The connection is still there. Yeah, um, I don't, I, yeah, have I, a, I have a real, I have no idea. They have a big dilemma and I don't know how they're going to solve it. The dilemma is um, how do we credit these things that were lies told by other people before we came here. If you're a current executive that was just installed by BlackRock, what do you do uh -huh. with 100 years, or not really, 60 years of Olivier's yeah. lies? How, how are okay. you going to move forward? Now I want to come to the kind of, we've had a good time here, so we're going to come to the key great point to end on, I think. Well, just, just one brief thing. Then. So what your, of course, all the details, you're going to have to read the book. There's so much here that you've, you've made me want to read the details about. There's so much more that you haven't told us, which is great. Essentially, uh, what we should know if people don't know this is that the creed that we know today really, really exploded with the release of 2010 Creed Aventus, which I think I may be right in saying outsold everything else they've ever done put together and then some and catapulted them to this new level where this big company wanted to buy them out. So this was the revolutionary one. And it can, it would be fair to say essentially the modern day creed that we know with these kind of bottles and everything essentially began to emerge in the, the mid early to mid 80s after all this stuff you're talking about happened with with pierre bourdon is, is, is that a fair summary yeah yeah more Great. or less sure yeah thank yeah. you here's the big question i'm sure everybody watching this will be wondering are you not a bit worried that creed are going to be really angry with you and you might get some nasty repercussions from your book and how are you covering yourself for that by the way his opinions are his own and not the views of the mr smelly 
fragrance channel. I haven't read the book. Are, are you not worried? Uh, no, no, I'm not. And I'm not saying okay. that to be brash. I'm not saying that to be bold. No. The, the most responsible thing you can do is to do extensive research, then mm -hmm. say to yourself, how am I going to get fucked? And I've asked myself that <laughs> many ways, many, many Good. ways. And, and over, <laughs> you know, over dinner, di over dinner where you really shouldn't be using nasty words. I've, I've asked myself how I'm going to get fucked. And then the person next to me says, you know, we're eating dinner here, right? Anyway, uh, the plan was very simple. I did the research thoroughly. I double checked and triple checked what sources I could. Um, the publisher provided for a certain big sum of money to have a lawyer on retainer whose specialty is uh, combing through books for any word, word by word, for any possible yeah. defamatory, slightly exaggerated, untrue anything. So everywhere in the right. book has been has been thoroughly reviewed by a very yep. expensive but talented and competent um, literary lawyer. Uh, yeah. a, and I was there, you know, doing it alongside him. And there were discussions about the smallest of words, like everything was debated. Right. Okay. And then in addition to all of that, there is the sort of belief on my part um, that so someone's better angels uh, might prevail. And if in anger, they decide they want to sue it first, um, they may change their mind. That's probably somewhat naive. Um, no, I, I think the book is the book is what it is, and so yeah. there are basically three parties that could essentially be upset. Olivier yeah. Creed, while he doesn't own the company, could be very Good upset because point. Olivier Creed lied, and I'm telling you that he did. Um, the the people uh, at BlackRock who essentially took over the company, they could be very upset because I am sure they did their due diligence and they know full well about the fabulism. Um, mm -hmm. And they've got to figure out for themselves how to deal with it. And here I am exposing it without, you know, strategizing. Like they're smart. Yeah. They know that lies are difficult to deal with, that fake histories are difficult to deal with. Um, mm. They want to do that on their own terms, presumably, and not my own. So they could be upset. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, and the third thing is, uh, BlackRock has established a great C-suite, a great team of executives in London. Um, the company yeah. is now led by Sarah Rotherham, an excellent uh, fragrance CEO. I believe previously she was at Miller Harris and Penn Halligan's, so accomplished and smart and, and savvy. Um, and they have their own plans for how to lead this company, so they could be upset as well. But, right. and I've spoken to people uh, uh, at Creed currently yeah. who were installed by the BlackRock folks. They were very nice to me. Obviously, we and didn't get So they much. know this book is coming out? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. In fact, the initially when I was speaking to the chief marketing officer, um, uh, I think it's pronounced Giles, Giles Gordon. Yeah. Uh, he was saying, we'd love to help you with your book. Like what archival material could we possibly wow. provide? Um, okay. I, I think then after that very nice Zoom, it, would, it became apparent to him because he had just joined the company that perhaps mm. the archival material would be more <laughs> injurious to Creed than he, than he realized. So our, yes. our next conversation was, his, uh, was him saying, well, we're going to pursue a Creed book. We're going to do a Creed book about the history of our brand or whatever, mm -hmm. something to that effect. So, yeah. so we really, we, we don't want to, we don't want to do your book also because we'd yeah. be competing against ourselves. So why don't we yeah. just each do our own books? And okay. I think that's a very sensible decision on a lot of levels. So, yeah. and that was literally in the middle of my, my research. The company was bought in 2020. This probably was a conversation from spring of 2021. So mm -hmm. they knew well, they knew, they knew full well what I was doing. Um, they didn't tell me how they were going to respond to it. And it's been literally a day since the book went on sale. So I've not gotten yeah. a direct note from them. Um, okay. I've gotten weird direct notes from people who don't belong to this company saying that I've sort of desecrated something. When in reality, what I think I'm really saying is all of these perfumes, they are just, they're better maybe than you even realized because they were yeah, made yeah. by the very best people in the world. I, I don't really understand the mentality that, oh, I've told you who made your amazing perfume and that person's a genius. So now in yep. your mind, what you bought is degraded. Why? Yes. <laughs> it was made It was made by maybe the greatest, you know, olfactory mind yep. of all time. Be more yep. proud, not less. So uh, they know I'm doing this book, yep. uh, the, the company's new uh, uh, executive office. The, it'll yep. be interesting to see how they respond. Um, but the reason that I am I'm, I'm not afraid is because they are very smart and BlackRock is yeah. very smart. And I think they know, unlike the haters on Facebook, right? That yeah. even bad publicity, even publicity yeah. that undermines 
you know, these fake historical tales, yes. it's still yes. great publicity. So hundred I, percent. I, I have to believe, and maybe I'll be yes. proven wrong. I have to believe that the people in charge of this brand now know full well yeah. that the attention that's being drawn to it at this very moment will yeah. only inure to their benefit. And to be honest, 100%. I hope it does. I like fragrance. Yes. I love yeah, fragrance. Well, we both love, we both love Creed. And we both yeah, love them we and are, we buy we them. And we think they're amazing. We love Creed fragrances. Man, I used to intern at Esquire in the fashion closet in the year 2005 in a summer. And yeah. uh, Nick Sullivan, who's now like the creative director of the Esquire in America, uh, yeah. he was at the time the fashion director. Nick Sullivan, yeah. and we're going back like 15 years, 16 years, he wore Green Irish Tweet as his signature scent. I love yeah. Nick. Nick's a great guy. Yeah. I'm a magazine guy. You know, so the idea that I'm out to like tear down people because no, Green no. Irish Tweed was made by Pierre Bourdon instead of like, you know, at the deathbed of Cary Grant. That's ridiculous. Yeah. It, it smells great. Fantastic. And Nick Sullivan was the coolest dude I ever met. Yeah. So we're both Creed fans. In, we're actually Creed fans. And the, uh, listen, if I had seen this video that we're going to put up here and I'd never heard of Creed, I, I, had, I stumbled across it. And I didn't know about this. I would be thinking, "Wow, I got to smell some of these. They sound amazing." I wouldn't give a damn about the story, and so that's the first thing. And the the second thing is that you know the vast majority of people who buy all their fragrances in the boutiques couldn't give a stuff about any of this. Probably have never heard of there being any such thing as a perfume, and couldn't care less. So either way, the you know the vast majority of their customers couldn't care less. They wouldn't watch a video by it like this. And the people who do, well, for me, I'm still really happy to own them. And I'm just kind of like, really, they, they sound even better because you, you told us the amazing ingredients and the, the fun story. So I don't see any problem. So, yeah, I think it's, it's you're absolutely right. All, all publicity is good publicity. And I've just become even more interested in the story of the House of Creed than I was before. So this is fantastic. I would say for people who think that I have an axe to grind or for people who think a book like yeah. this is about me capitalizing on some... No some like someone's misdeeds. Um, this was ultimately all about learning how this industry works, who the people are, and mm. what crazy combinations of life events lead to the things we see at boutiques and in department stores and the things that we smell. You know, Silver Mountain Water, which is a creed scent that the FragCom people who watch this will be aware of, um, mm. was a rejected Isimiyaki scent that Pierre Bourdon did. Now, wow. Isimiyaki is a Japanese company the whole idea of isimiyaki at the start was that we need something that's like water because the Japanese don't like strong scents. So we need something yes. that's watery by nature. That's what Shiseido yes. wanted, and that's what they got. They chose a Jacques Cavalier composition, right? So they totally got you that. You mean Lo Uh Yeah, the original one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the original. The original, the original. And so, Makes so, sense. Yeah. so Pierre, Pierre, of course, was disappointed. When you lose a brief to somebody, you're disappointed. Cavalier yeah. won, so he got to make the isimiyaki. But wow. we now have the Isimiyaki from Cavalier, and because the scent lost, and Olivier Creed is a master evaluator, Olivier Creed knew this might have been a loser in Isimiyaki's eyes, but not in mine. And so yeah. it was turned into Silver Mountain Water. So now wow. we have both Isimiyaki and Silver Mountain Water. And what I would humbly suggest to anyone who thinks this is a book that's about knocking things down, um, consider how gleeful I am at the idea that. Uh, essentially through this process of competition and and briefing a multitude of interesting similar yet different sense was was created if if, mm. if this is about knocking down things and sort of ruining fragrance then i don't know what celebrating fragrance is no no i mean this is just I, i've just become more and more interested in the whole story and creed and i don't think there's anything really that bad uh, for the person who, who might like to buy Creed fragrances from this. And I want to see the movie of this book now, and I haven't even read it. I mean, this is, I'm thinking who plays Olivia Creed. We've got the uncle, we've got the playboy, we've got the conservative guy, we've got Irwin racing his cars, we've got Pierre Bourdon. I mean, this is, we need this film, man. You're going to get the rights to the film. Make sure you secure that. I, I own a percentage of them, not the, as much of a percentage as I would like, but, you know, we'll see. You but do. I will say, yeah. this. can I tell you right. something? I, look, Pierre is not a bitter person. You know, in fact, Pierre, there's something about his embrace of literature that feels like so like energetic. But when we were at lunch, you know, Pierre was talking about how when he first saw this imposing figure of Olivier Creed enter his office, he thought, and this is truly like almost a verbatim quote. It might yeah. be in the book as a verbatim quote. This yeah. man looks like Sean Connery. Like this is James Bond. That was Pierre's opinion of Olivier Creed. So, yes, uh, I can see it. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, he, he's like, this is an international man of mystery. That was literally his first thought. Um, and the seduction sort of began there and went into some very weird places. So um, it, it began as a weird true life event with a movie twist. If it ends in a movie, I, I can't say I'll complain. And hopefully we all can be healthy enough to go to theaters safely. So this needs to be a movie. Please, can I have a tiny bit part as some kind of extra... <laughs> Some kind of guy working in the creek have, shop. Have you ever I'll seen you. They do to authors? They take the book and tell the author, we're going to make this movie now. Bye-bye. Uh, but if I should have some power over casting, <laughs> I will put in a word for you. I promise you that. Thank you, I, man. I really this will. is amazing. Yeah. I, I've got to thank you so much, Gabe. Uh, Gabe Oppenheim, the author of the fantastically exciting book that I haven't read yet, but God damn it, it sounds if it's half as good as it sounds, it's going to be amazing. The Ghost Perfumer. You can buy it now. You know, it's women say that about dating me. Hey, you know, if it's half as good as you, you know, it sounds, and I, I, yeah. I yeah. but in this it's, instance, it's, it actually is. You know, oftentimes they're like, well, that was a rather disappointing thing. But the, in, yeah. in all reality, I do believe that that this book, like, I hate boasting. I really hate it. But yeah, marketing yeah. is necessary, and in this instance, I do feel comfortable saying it's not hype and it's not marketing. It's it's all no. really there. This yeah. is fire. This is just such a great, not only a perfume, you don't have to be into perfume to read this book, although most of my audience is, the human story is amazing. So yeah, I'm so excited to get my copy. I'm going to do more videos about it. Can I get you to come back on and do something after I've read it too? Anytime you want. This you, was such a, a pleasure and an honor both. You'll probably so. be too busy talking to the Hollywood people. You won't have time for me, but hey, I'm glad I was here at the start. Gabe, I'm going to end it there. Guys, comment down below anything you want to know. Do you want this guy back on the program? Shall we get him on a live stream? That would be an amazing thing. Uh, comment that's, down that's, below. Thank that's you. some risky business, but I'm not saying no. I'm just saying that's well, some you, risky business. Just be very careful. Just be very careful. Uh, we will see you in the next episode. Remember, uh, what is my catchphrase? Ah, oh, yes. Whatever you're doing in life, let's project. And sometimes life may stink, but we can always smell good. See you in the next one, guys. Bye-bye.